Welcome to 132 Problems Revisiting Mormon Polygamy, where we explore the scriptural, theological, and historical case for plural marriage. I am excited to be able to bring this episode to you today. I was able to sit down a few weeks ago for a second conversation with historian Barbara Jones Brown, this time to discuss post manifesto polygamy. And I think you'll be excited to see the incredible, amazing connections that we discovered that really made this conversation much more exciting for both of us. We actually had spent several hours on the phone the night before just going over all of the amazing ways that we found that we line up. So I'm excited for you to hear that part of it. Um, I always, again, want to recommend that people start at the beginning of this podcast, or at least go back and understand the scriptural case that we laid out first to understand if polygamy is ever of God, because I think that's the most important question. And then proceeding on to the questions about Joseph Smith. And then I realized I really have not done much yet on post-manifesto polygamy other than talking about my family. And so this is kind of the first conversation I'll have about post-manifesto polygamy, but I think that there will be many more in the future. So I'm glad you're here and thank you for joining us as we take this deep dive into the very murky waters of post-manifesto Mormon polygamy. Welcome to this episode. I'm so excited to be here again with uh, my new friend, Barbara Jones Brown. And I think I can call you a friend at this point because we've had a fun little adventure together. So it's been I crazy to... the connection we figured <laughs> out. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, so I have to just quickly share if that's okay and feel free to add anything. But I actually, I'm still a little bit swollen. I had to have a big facial surgery this, um, this a couple of weeks ago and I've been recovering. You and look so great. I, oh, you look thank great. you. You're, yeah. I just am a little bit more. I would never cheap. know you just had surgery. <laughs> Thank you. But so anyway, I was going to cancel my interviews this week. I canceled my other. And then I went to text Barbara and it was just this complete stupor of thought. Like I couldn't. So I was like, okay. So, and and just being me, how I worked. So I just prayed about it and, and I just felt like, okay, I'll try again tomorrow. And then as I went and prayed about it, I just felt like, no, don't cancel. And so I was like, okay. And then, so despite everything, I started to get ready for the interview and I looked up more of Barbara's work because you've done a ton of work on post-manifesto polygamy and lo and behold, she researched my family in depth in huge depth and so when i texted her last night to send her the um or yesterday evening to send her the link i was like and this is going to be so fun you researched my family so i get this text back that was like what who are they <laughs> so needless to say i think we spent what three hours on the phone last night yeah, until batteries family, died family history which i studied um for years and wrote about for years so that's a crazy connection crazy small world so yeah so and this is actually oh, that, like polygamy you know we're gonna be talking about post-manifesto polygamy today but it was so interesting to find out that polygamy including post manifesto polygamy was practiced so recently in your in your family line so it's it's closer right. for you personally. it is it is it's close mm -hmm. my mother's mother was raised in in polygamy post manifesto mormon friendly polygamy like they were at flds yes, right sanctioned. they were yes, sanctioned yeah sanctioned right and I, I we need a term for it because i call it yeah. post post manifesto <laughs> because we we should tell well anyway first of all welcome welcome thank and you. thank you for being here and i'm thank so excited you. to talk to you officially on the record as well as how much fun we had talking last night and more today as she's been sharing sources with me and i got on the phone with my mom and tried to find out all kinds of history <laughs> but um so those of you who who didn't watch our last episode barbara co-wrote Vengeance is Mine, which is the second book that she was involved with on the Mountain Meadows Massacre. So I just, so you have to know, like this lady's tough as nails. Mountain Meadows <laughs> Massacre and post-manifesto polygamy are her two specialties. Which I just, I know I always joke about, I just kind of fell into both. I was hired by both to start working on these subjects. I wasn't out looking for these subjects. They just both kind of fell into my lap. So I say, yeah, I write probably about the two most controversial topics in Mormon history, the massacre and post-manifesto polygamy. So 
go figure. <laughs> Those are for sure the hardest topic. So I, mm -hmm. so this is amazing to talk to you. And, um, and so, yeah, so we spoke last time about mountain meadows and, and didn't have very much time. So you, so we're, we're now talking about post manifesto polygamy, her other area of expertise, which she got into by studying my post post manifesto polygamy ancestors. So this is real. I like, I think, I don't know. You and I, we we geeked out. We really geeked out last <laughs> night for several hours. Man, so crazy. hopefully this will be as fun and interesting to the audience as it is to both of us. So do you want to explain how you got into post-manifesto polygamy? You said you were hired, but like... Sure. Yeah. So I um, am a former editor for the Ensign Magazine. Um, I My undergraduate major was journalism and English. And so I worked for many years as a professional editor including from the Ensign Magazine. And while working there, I started editing church history articles. So I started getting interested in church history, um, which led to both projects that, that will, that the Mountain Meadows project and then Post Manifesto Polygamy. Anyways, I, um, after I had my first baby, I resigned from full-time work at the Ensign so I could spend more time at home with her, but I was still involved with freelance work. And uh, two men came to me and asked me to write the biography of their mother. Her name was Lorna Call Alder, and she was born um, into an LDS-sanctioned polygamous marriage. In She's my great aunt. That's so, right. Okay. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, my great half aunt. We have different, we're from different mothers. <laughs> right. Same great, great grandfather. Or well, her mm -hmm. father her was your grandfather. Great, great, we're great one generation off. Grandfather. So um, Anson mm -hmm. Bowen Call was his name. She was still alive. She was 98 years old at the time. And she died when she was 107. So I was fortunate enough to be able to do 38 oral history interviews with her as part of this project. And then I started just delving into doing all the research on her family history and um, life in what was colloquial called the Mormon colonies of northern Mexico, Chihuahua, Mexico. And that's where I learned all about post-manifesto polygamy. Um, so that's how I okay. came into that project. And then after I completed that project, um, I was hired to edit a book called Massacre in Mountain Meadows for Richard Turley, Ron Walker, and Glenn Leonard, who wrote that book. Um, I was working for the church history department full time again then. Um, and then later I co-authored, as you mentioned, Vengeance is Mine, The Mountain Meadows Massacre and its Aftermath with Richard Turley. So those have been my two and, big projects that I've, I've worked on in, in Mormon history. Okay, so that's good to get the timeline. So you were hired to do the to do Lorna's um, biography before you I started on Mountain me. Meadows. Mm -hmm. And yes. then, do you know why they came to you? Do, um, so they had gone to um, someone at the Ensign Magazine. They were looking for someone, you know, that would be a good writer and editor. And, um, and then someone referred them to me. They said, oh, well, Barbara Jones Brown is great and she's looking for freelance work. And so Perfect. they referred okay. to me to that. And they actually um, had me do some editing first on, uh, I'll hold it up, this biography on Anson Bowen Call, your ancestor. Let's see. Mm -hmm. There we go. Which was actually being yeah. written by Lorna Call Alder and um, actually wrote the introductory chapter for that book. So that's that's in that book. Oh. Um and then and after she, that, they asked me to write her biography. Okay. Can we talk really quickly about her? Because I didn't even know about her really until I saw that you had worked on her and looked She's her amazing. up more. She was an amazing woman, really a remarkable woman. Yeah. So that book, as kind of the final thing of her life, she wrote that, What was, was it published when she was 103? Was she 103 when that was published? 102. 102. Yeah, and, and she was an award winner co-author, uh, Bill Hartley, who uh, William Hartley, who was a BYU uh, professor. They won the Mormon History Association Best Biography Award that year. And so when she, I was there at the ceremony when she received that award, and everybody, when they announced, you know, told about her and said she'd been born in 1906 as she's walking up to receive her award, like there was just a gasp in the room, and everybody was like. 1906. <laughs> so I believe she's she the is oldest Mormon person. history. <laughs> yeah, the oldest author ever to win a history award at 102. 
by from my oh, matrix. So my word. A pretty cool moment. So obviously perfectly sharp and mobile and still super looking. sharp up until the end of her life. Incredibly sharp mind still. Yeah. Yeah. So so maybe we can start by talking about her because I think it's so interesting because so she in a day she was her mother was a polygamist. She was like okay. right she's and so um her yeah I, I should say she was raised in polygamy herself. Mm -hmm. And um and they weren't the let's see that was Anson Bowen and Thressa but her mother was Julia the fourth Julia, wife, right? Yeah, yeah her parents so were Anson the, Bowen call and Julia Abeg call. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so she was the younger wife that what was Anson Bowen close to 40 and she was a yeah, teenager? So, so Anson is well, he went by Bowen, so let's just call him Bowen. Bowen. Mm -hmm. Um, Bowen was 39 when he married her mother, Julia, who was 17, and she okay. was his fourth wife. Okay, and uh, the two other wives was, had passed away, one, or yeah, one other wife had passed away, so. Bowen at that time had two living wives, Theresa, who was your ancestor, and then Dottie Pratt. And uh, Dottie was Parley P. Pratt's granddaughter. Okay. Uh, Dottie passed away a few years later, but make a long story short, when when Bowen and Julia were married, he was he's he had two living wives at the time, Theresa and Dottie. Okay. And that was a hard there. So, so one thing I loved talking to Barbara, I don't want to speak for you. So you can say, but like, if you're going to live polygamy, do it like the calls did, right? Like they were one of the best if, families if, you can find. If, if you're going to live it, um, I would I, recommend it. They were, they were good people. They were living uh, a principle that they believed that their church leaders had started and taught and what they were taught you had to do in order to reach the highest degree of the celestial kingdom or the, the Mormon heaven, the mm -hmm. Latter-day Saint heaven, if you will. Exaltation. And so they were, both, they were living, they made great sacrifices to live this incredibly difficult and, and hard principle, but they made the most of it. And uh, they were good people. I was I was always impressed with how good these people were. Mm -hmm. That's what I, I I guess what I'm saying is like they made they did it about as well as it could be done is how it looks to me. Like for the most part with Thressa and yeah. and Bowen, yeah. But but mm -hmm. even they, it was a struggle with Julia because. So Julia was so much younger, and Bowen so kind of younger. decided on his own. To marry, like, like he had a revelation, and and informed Thressa and Dottie that he was marrying, that God mm -hmm. wanted him to marry Julia, who was seventeen, yeah. and so mm -hmm. that was always tricky. They had children that age, <laughs> right? So, so well, still um, Julia situation. was still quite a bit younger than I think Bowen and Thressa's youngest, but not a ton. I mean, I mean, she oh, was mean like, okay. like maybe uh, I can't give you the exact number, up, like 17 yeah. or 18 years younger. So they weren't the same age, but, but yes, yeah, she was significantly well, younger than, Bowen. I mean, I mean, she was the age of Thressa's children. She was close to the age of their children. No, wasn't no she was, uh, she no. was like 15 or 17 years younger than Thressa and Bowen's youngest child. I could look at it right now if you want me to take the Okay. Time. I could. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll figure that out. I'm, maybe I'm okay, just confused. Yeah. But so but, she was um, still significantly. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was trying to say she's she was the age of about the age of their children is what it seems like it would normally be in yeah. those situations. Let Maybe we're let's see. Look. So I just want to make sure I'm giving accurate information here. So Julia so was born in, oldest was born in eighty six. Yeah. So Julia was born in eighteen eighty five. So yes, she yeah. was the same was the age, age as her oldest. Her, yeah, you're right. right. Sorry, that's what I, I mean. She's, she was yeah. literally her daughter's. And she was in between those first two daughters. Yeah. The second daughter is my great grandmother. Exactly. So she was, right exactly. So she was mm -hmm. older than Theresa and Bowen's youngest child, Velen. No, yeah, right. But, yeah, but she but was the, the age same of her age children. as their oldest daughter. Yeah, yeah. It's it's pretty tough. Yeah. So it is. But yeah. um, and so Lorna was the oldest daughter of Julia, that teenage wife, and That's she right. was a spitfire. She in that generation went not only got her undergraduate degree but went to was it columbia and got her master's yeah, she, degree she, she earned then, a she earned a degree four-year degree at byu starting in 1926 and not when when not a lot of women 
LDS or just American women in general were not going to college and getting college degrees very often at that age. In fact, not even just women, just people in general weren't getting a lot of college. Not a lot of people were getting college degrees in that era. Um, that came about later over time. But right. so she learned that degree in 1926 and, and, or excuse me, in the 1920s. And then she goes off later to Columbia University to earn a master's degree in education. So she was she was remarkable for her time, uh, was, whether being polygamous or LDS or not. That was really remarkable for women to do. That was um, for sure. Rare. And then she was she was a BYU professor or BYA, yeah. I guess, Brigham Young uh -huh. Academy. Yeah. Later, and she so becomes a, a professor at BYU and she taught education for many, many years at Brigham Young University. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, cause I called my mom to ask about her. So I've done episodes in the past with my mom, people that know Janine Brady, that's my mom. And she lived with Lorna in Provo her first semester at BYA. Mm -hmm. So she knew Lorna and her husband and the two little boys when, you know, cause my mom's older okay. than Lorna's two sons. Yeah. So those and two little boys are the ones that hired me to write right. their mother's book. Yeah. Isn't that fun? And this was interesting. This was an insight. Like my mom kind of had culture shock going from her very, very obedient, polygamously raised mother to going into Lorna's home where Lorna and her husband were more equals. You know, I called yeah. my mom back and I was like, you were so used to the very, very submissive wife that to see a wife who was an equal to her husband for as Lorna would have been more than my mom was used to. Do you know what I mean? It was yeah. culture shock to her because my mom really was raised like you don't you don't disagree with your husband. You don't yeah. raise your you don't argue back like it's very much like, is there a fork? And mm -hmm. one of the mother or one of the daughters gets up and gets a fork for the husband or one of the sons. That yeah. was the culture. I, I will say that Lorna was absolutely uh, equal with her husband. And of course they were in a monogamous marriage, but yeah, she was very well educated. Yeah. She had her own career. Um, she herself didn't marry until she was 39, had her first baby at 41 and her second baby at 46. Um, so okay. yeah, she was very much a, a strong, well-educated woman who would have considered herself e very much equal with her husband. Right. I think that's profound. And um, yeah. yeah, so so a story that I got, I called my cousin this morning. Well, my mother's cousin. I'm a generation below. But she did you get the little black eyed girl story in Lorna's biography? Do you remember? Oh, that? about Mariah. About uh -huh. Mariah. So uh -huh. yeah. I read about one that. One thing that everyone remembers about Lorna is she would say, come sit on the lap that sat on the lap that's of Joseph Smith. Because but Lorna of course. But Lorna didn't Come sit it. on the lap. No, she she said sit on the lap that sat on the lap of the, that like, sat on the lap. Of sat Joseph. on the lap. So yeah. maybe I'm three missing one. Back. Yeah, three yeah. generations back. So yeah. so just really quickly, Anne Maria Bowen, my ancestor that I've talked about before, she was the one that was orphaned. She was 15 and drove a team across the plains. Her sister's team saved them them from going down the river. Like like she was. Yeah. Ama this amazing woman. Then at 17, when she was in the Valley, she was given away to marry Anson Call as his young teenager by nobody's consent. Like Brigham Young just assigned that in conference. And then she was sent away. She was divorced and her children were kept and they went back and got the baby. I've told this story before. It's a tragic story. But as a little girl, there's this beautiful story. I wonder if I should take time to read it really quickly. The black eyed girl. Do you care if I yeah, quickly yeah. read so that? This is Lorna's grandmother, Mariah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's so it's her grandmother. So yeah. So I'll explain. And this is, this is Mariah. So Mariah is that 15 year old and then the 17 year old wife who was, her children were taken away and she was divorced. This is about her when she was a little girl and it's her mother that wrote it. So this is um, Mariah's mother's story. Her name was Charlotte Louisa Durham, Durham. And she said, while sewing a quilt with my dear friend, Emma, one lovely spring day, her husband, Joseph Smith, the prophet came through the open door and straight away greeted his beloved wife with a kiss saying, it's, it is good to be home, dear. She happily nodded in agreement. Then turning toward me, he exclaimed, what a pleasure to see you, mother Bowen, and cheerfully shook my hand. You as well, brother Joseph, I replied. Thank you, he stated, and then asked, and who is this young lady? 
He crouched down to get a good look at my quiet little girl standing next to me. Her name is Mariah. The prophet kindly asked, hello, Mariah, may I tell you a story? She shyly nodded. Then sitting in a large wooden rocking chair, the prophet gently lifted, up, lifted her up on his lap and began, many long years ago, there was a faith-filled group of 2,000 young men who marched into war to defend freedom. After fighting in a fierce battle, the boys were wounded, but miraculously, none of them died. Now, my young friend, do you know the reason why? Mariah shook her head and softly said, no. Because, he instructed, their mothers taught them that if they did not doubt, God would deliver them. Then the prophet paused, looked directly into her deep, dark eyes and asked, Someday, Mariah, do you think you could teach your children to have faith in Jesus Christ like the stripling warriors? Yes, I think I can, she promised, making him smile. Brother Joseph warmly set her down and agreed. That's right, my little black-eyed girl. Surely you shall. And mm -hmm. so that's family lore. I, I, I don't know if you came across that, but... That was written by Mariah's mother, which I thought was just a wonderful, charming little story. So mm -hmm. you came across that in your work? I can't remember whether I did or not. It's not ringing any bells right now, but I think okay. I think I do remember. And I'm so sorry. I, I did all this work like 20 years yeah. ago. So. Um, but I think I do remember something about um, Lorna's, Joseph Smith calling Lorna's grandmother's little black eyed girl. I think I remember just that okay. Point, but that's what he called her. Okay, but so that's I don't remember so, the, the family story that was passed down necessarily, but right. I was trying to do the math. I because I could say the same thing, but I'd have to say, "Come sit on the lap that sat on the lap that sat on the lap that sat on the lap of, jo <laughs> of the prophet Joseph Smith." Maybe yeah. there's one. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> it's a fun it's a fun story. So yeah. I like that one. I have to very quickly jump into the discussion at this point to explain something. That story that I just read to Barbara Jones Brown is not true. So my cousin had made this darling little book of all of um, her family history. It has both sides of her family, but one of those sides is my family history too. So it's this darling book that she um, worked so hard and compiled all of the pictures and stories about all of our ancestors. And after I read this story from it, I got a little bit concerned because I was like, wow, that's a really well-worded story that's very complete and didn't seem, you know, like I, I, got, I kind of started wondering where it had come from. So I started to try to look for it and couldn't find it anywhere. So I called her and after a bit of a conversation, she told me that she really wanted the children, her grandchildren, who she was primarily writing this um, book for, but all of the other children, to not just have a name and maybe a picture. She wanted them to feel some emotional connection to her ancestor. So she thought that it would be helpful to make up, to write little stories about her ancestors. So she, you know, she was prayerful about it and, and did, and I thought, thought it was a darling story, but she made it up. And if you look at it, I'll, I'll go add this back to the stage, you can see that it says, um, let me get over here where I can change the screen, that it's the little black eyed girl. Now that part of the story is true. That's the part that's come down in family history is that Joseph Smith called Anne Mariah Bowen his little black eyed girl. That part is true, but you can see what this says here at the top of the story, as told by Charlotte Louisa Durham Bowen, her mother. And I think that's the part that really confused me. I just read it and assumed it was true and didn't think, oh, I need to check this out as carefully as I try to check out other sources. I was so embarrassed after that I actually texted Barbara and was like, oh my gosh, this totally is not a true story. And she was so sweet and gracious and said, I thought it was just family lore. It was just fine. And I was tempted to erase it from the, from the conversation, but I actually thought it was very instructive. It certainly was to me and probably to all of us about how history often gets done. How like sometimes a very well-meaning family member for, for sweet and um, good reasons makes up stories and then passes them on. And all of the children who grow up reading this are going to think that's a true story about their ancestor and pass that on, right? It also can happen sometimes for a little bit more nefarious purposes when you're trying to prove something or trying to claim something that's not necessarily true. But I just thought this was a great experience to see how tricky history can be for a huge variety of reasons. Now back to the conversation. Anyway, so so that's Lorna. And then um, from there, did you write your, so I know you've done several papers or chapters in books mm -hmm. about post-manifesto polygamy. Were those before or after Mountain Meadows or 
in between. This was, this was before. Well, actually, I think it was actually during because Rick and I wrote um, Vengeance is Mine over, it took uh, 14 years that we were on that book. Wow. And so, okay. yeah. Um, so, and, and part of the reason it took so long is we were also working on other projects. It wasn't like we were both just full time on one book, but also but just the, the research was exhaustive and we were, I mean, we did really, really thorough, deep research. So that's part of the reason. And then the other part of the reason was we were, you know, always involved in other projects as well. And so I was kind of simultaneously, uh, working on this project, but, um, uh, uh, do you want to I show them? Yes. Yeah, so I wanted to share just two chapters I wrote, um, in two books. So on, on the subject, if people want to read more about it. So there is this one, it's called just South of Zion, the Mormons in Mexico and the borderlands. And I have a chapter in here about post manifesto polygamy as it was practiced in Chihuahua, Mexico. And the reason why, um, Latter-day Saints colon colonizers came from uh, Utah and, and Arizona and Wyoming and, and why they went down to Mexico to start these colonies. So do you um, know where I looked for that book and I couldn't, I'm sure I didn't look enough, but where it can was I published this? by the University of New Mexico Press? And let's see. Okay, so I'll have to see if I can you. find it. I couldn't find it. Uh, published in 2015. Yeah, so I was okay. definitely working on this simultaneously with working on Mountain Minnows. Um, the other chapter, and this one is more thorough. thorough. This one goes more into post-manifesto polygamy and the, the policy and the politics behind it and how it fell out of practice in mainstream Mormonism. Um, so okay. there's a chapter in this book as well. It's called The Persistence of Polygamy 3. Fundamentalist Mormon polygamy from 1890 to the present. And so I also talk about your family members as, as well in here, but then again, more into the church policy and all of the history and so forth. But this book was also published in 2015. Um, okay. The chapter in this book won uh, the Mormon History Association's Best Article Award on International History. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so if we read, so the persistence of pers polygamy is available. And so I do, I do have that one, but if I read that one, do I need to read the other one too? Is there a lot of overlap? Do they handle there, Yeah, there is some things? overlap. Like, um, as I mentioned, so the one that's just south of Zion is more about Mex. It includes more Mexican history. Mexican. Okay. Um, so okay. it ties that, it brings that more into the story and the persistence of polygamy one goes more into, more into church policy and, and. LDS Church headquarters history and the political history of why, how um, it ended in mainstream okay. Latter Day Saint practice. Okay, and and I told Barbara I really like I I wanted to read that I went out of my way to make sure I had that article before our interview today, but I instead spent the whole evening talking on the phone. <laughs> so I haven't read it yet. So I'm really excited to, but, um, but it, from what I did read, it looks phenomenal. And so now we can dig into post manifesto polygamy. I guess I first want to ask when you started studying, I guess for Lorna, were, what surprise, were you surprised? And oh, very surprised. A very surprised because I was not yet a professional historian. Um, I had not had any formal and training training uh, in history yet. I should mention that I, um, uh, after I started, and I think I pretty much finished my biography of Lorna. Um, I went back to graduate school and earned a master's degree in American history from the University of Utah. So yeah, so I was not super well versed in um, church history, Mormon history, um, and so when I started reading this family story and I found out that they were sealed in, in marriage after the 1890 manifesto. And I guess for readers or listeners who don't know what that is, we had to explain that. But in 1890, yeah. the president of the church at the time, Wilford Woodruff, he issued a manifesto saying that the church is no longer encouraging um, plural marriage or um contracting new plural marriages. So when I found out that that they were, 
Um, and that's that, included in our Doctrine and Covenants. That's the first manifesto still yeah, canonized yeah. in our Doctrine and Covenants. And if you look at that manifesto, it's very carefully worded. It says anywhere in the territory. So that was true, mm -hmm. but it's it's kind of misleading because they were contracting new and encouraging new plural marriages outside of the United States. So that's why you have all these folks moving to Mexico who already were polygamists. And so they wanted to live um, without free of persecution in their polygamous families. So they went to Mexico to live free of that and, or to Canada. And I should point out though, that um, polygamy was illegal in Mexico. That's a, a misconception that sometimes people have. They think it was legal, but what it was, um, leaders in Mexico wanted that colonization. They wanted to encourage um, farmers, Mormon farmers to come in and help develop the Mexican economy by living there. So they kind of agreed to just look the other way and say, if you don't say anything about it, if you don't make a big deal about the fact that you're so practicing polygamy, we will just kind of look the other way. And again, I, I go into detail in this in, in these articles, if people want to delve into that. Oh, that'll be fun so, to read. Okay. Yeah. So any anyway, so, so Mexico I was to learn that actually new merit, new plural marriages were being contracted in the church. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so in a way, the colonies thrived because of the manifesto, right? Like oh, absolutely. Wasn't that the reason for yeah. being mm -hmm. is yeah, absolutely. So um, so a couple of and, and I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm so sorry. This research is. I no, so, no, you're great. But a I couple of um, church leaders, I think it was Helaman Pratt, who was Parley P. Pratt's son and another apostle. Again, it's in the article, but they go south in the 1880s um, because anti-polygamy legislation is ramping up. It's heating up in the United States. And so they start exploring places where these polygamous families can live in peace without being, um, you know, having their the, the fathers put into prison. Uh, in their striped like, pajamas because of the, yeah, yeah like yeah, the Edmonds the Act, the Edmonds right? Tucker Act. That, exactly. Right. So okay. they start looking for so places where families can, can live in peace from this. So that's why they start going okay. south of the border into Mexico. And then they, they purchase land and then a lot more, particularly after the manifesto, a lot more polygamous families start moving there in earnest or people who want to live the principle of polygamy start moving there in earnest. So. There were several uh, Latter-day Saint colonies in Chihuahua and Sonora, okay. Mexico. Okay. So Anson Bowen Call, he was, as I've said, Mariah, his mother, when she was sent away, he was either three or four. He was the youngest other than the baby that she took. So he moved down there and he ended up, he was the bishop. I, I believe it was Colonial Dublon is where That's my right. grandmother was born. Yep. And so he was the bishop there for something like, 30, 30 years 30 years yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay and so he was he was the polygamous bishop in one of them <laughs> in, yeah. I mean, there one of them right 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 in colonia juarez to which um still mm -hmm. still exists as a mormon community today not not polygamous in mainstream latter-day saint practice but um and the juarez academy is in colonia juarez um so that yeah, so there were other communities where there were bishops. And you the said you've even home. been to my great grandparents' home. Like it, it's yeah. still that's incredible. It was, okay. it was surreal to write this whole story, write all about the home, write all these stories about their lives there, and then to go down there and visit oh. the home, walk inside the home that I had written. It was like getting in a time machine and writing about the tithing office that's still standing there and um, various buildings and structures that are still there. That was, that was surreal. It was really neat, really powerful experience to go. That's incredible. So is it still there? Is Colonial Duplan still there as well as Colonial Juarez? It's been absorbed by like, I, I can't remember the other community, but it's just kind of grown, of course, many over the last a hundred plus years. So other communities have kind of, grown and absorbed it. So really the, the, the only community that still has quite a bit of a, a Latter-day Saint population is Colonia Juarez, where the Juarez Stake Academy is. And there's a temple there now. There's an LDS temple there. Okay. 
Okay, so I just, I, I want to make a caveat here, and you can correct if I get anything wrong. So Barbara and I did talk for a long time, both about our points of agreement and our points of very strong disagreement. Mm -hmm. But um, it was interesting. So so most people that are my listeners will know what we're talking about. But um, it was interesting to hear that, like, like, I have found it interesting. Joseph F. Smith just was telling one story and doing something very different. We we know that, mm -hmm. right? But I think he justified that because he thought that's what Joseph Smith did, it, it seems to me. And for people that see them being of the same character, right? It seems to a lot of people like, it doesn't matter to me if Joseph denied polygamy because I read Joseph F. Smith denying polygamy and it feels the same. Not, yeah, that's not just Joseph F. Smith, but all of the leaders denying after the 1890 manifesto denying that it was being practiced anymore when in fact it is is very much being practiced still and so not just Joseph Smith but many leaders and so that's why yeah I mean you know we we respectfully mm -hmm. disagree I I I yeah. firmly believe that Joseph Smith instituted um, polygamy but but again, we respectfully yeah, disagree a on that. For another Different day. interpretations. Right. But um, so, yeah, seeing how um, church leaders very much were publicly denying the practice of uh, polygamy long after <laughs> post manifesto, I have no problem believing uh, that Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith were also publicly denying that they were practicing it while pu privately practicing it. But anyways, that's a right. discussion and for another day. Those, yeah, those can, those discussions will be had at a different time. Yeah. But um, there was something I wanted to say. Oh, so I don't know if this came up in your research, but this, so the story I was raised on, because it was very important. I didn't understand all the implications as a little girl. I just thought, so one of the things Barbara and I talked about, sorry, I'm going in a bunch of different directions. You have to remind me if I lose my train of thought again that I'm talking about Joseph F. Smith and my grandfather, my great grandfather. But one thing we talked about is our extremely different views of polygamy growing up, because I grew up very close to very close to your family history. Yeah. Polygamy. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I I genuinely thought that polygamy and the law of consecration are the laws of Zion and of heaven. And as soon as we're righteous enough and worthy to live those laws, then Jesus can come. And like, like that was my perspective, which I think shocked a lot. I, and I didn't even know it was, I didn't know that wasn't just objectively true for any Mormon. Yeah, right? I, like, probably. Yeah. And I think it's fascinating. So, so I come from polygamy, polygamous ancestors as well, but much further back in, in my family, I, uh, have no instances of post manifesto polygamy in my in my family lines. Even um, eighteen so probably, post post post, post 1890. Okay. Yeah, um, and so so yeah, so polygamy in your family line is much closer to you than it is for me. So for me, I was taught about my ancestors practicing polygamy. Probably my most famous polygamous ancestor was Willard Richards who was oh, um, you know, an apostle good. and in the first presidency and was with Joseph and Hiram when they were assassinated. And he was there when polygamy was starting in Nauvoo. He was there. Um, but He was a Nauvoo polygamist, yeah. Yes, he was, he, yes. Um, another famous polygamous ancestor I have is Christopher Layton, whom Layton, Utah is named after. He had 10 wives and 65 children, the most recorded in LDS church history, that that's the most children that anyone is recorded as having. So those are kind of my two most How many was it? What was What's the that? number? How many children? How 65, many children? 65 and John wow. D. Lee had 64. <laughs> so Wow. Yeah. Okay. So my, my dad grew up just telling me about these polygamous ancestors. But for me, what he the way he would say it to me, it was just like, oh, well, that's something they did in the past. You know, we haven't done that for a long, 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 long time. And that was just an old. And so in my mind as a kid growing up, I thought of it as just, oh, it's just this old marriage system that doesn't exist anymore. Rather than I was never taught by by my family that it was like, oh, it's this principle and we, it has to be done. And we're going to have it in the celestial kingdom and all that. I never grew up hearing that from my ancestors. So it's interesting to compare like different ways of of how we were told about our polygamous ancestors. Definitely. And I think that both groups still exist within the church. I think, I think sure, that probably sure, the, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. Like the majority of church members, I would think, are like, uh, weird, gross. Yeah, that's gone. <laughs> Goodbye. We don't want to think about it. Right. Kind of. Uh-huh. And then I think there is a group of church members that haven't gone on the same journey I've gone on that are um, very like like Brigham Young said, the only men who will be gods or sons of gods are those who are polygamous. And then going on later, he says, at least polygamous in their heart. Right. And I think there are a lot mm-hmm. of people that are like, I'm a polygamist in my heart. So I qualify for those blessings in the church and then we have the whole interesting fundamental situation mm-hmm. the first time i met i met some lovely girls from the all red group that i became somewhat friends with i was in their home a few times and they told me the stories of their ancestors and i was like works for me you know like they were told they were told that their ancestors were told by the president of the church that they were called to be separate from the church and to keep the principle alive until the day that the church and the principle could come back together. So they, and I was like, that makes sense. Cause so this is the story I was going to tell you my, our family history. And of course it's not written down anywhere. So, you know, because yeah, so it's it legend be. or family lore. Well, sure. I shouldn't say there's not a, there's not a documentation you can find yeah. from Joseph F. Smith because there wouldn't be right. right. But it is in our histories is in that, head, yeah. <laughs> Um, that that um, Joseph F. Smith called my grandfather to go to Mexico to take a second wife. So so again, for anyone that hasn't heard, so um, Will, my um, William Gailey Sears was married to um, Aggie, and um, Aggie met Cameron. She was the daughter of a, a of a general authority of some sort. Anyway, they were unable to have children, and my great grandfather had a dream that he had a family. So I believe he went and talked to Joseph F. Smith, and Joseph F. Smith called him to go to Mexico to take another wife so that he could have his family. And my grandfather said, "But I thought we weren't doing that anymore." And Joseph F. Smith said, "I'm not calling you as the president of the church. I'm calling you as the president of the priesthood." Hmm. and and sent him to Mexico. And that really rings true in terms of what Joseph F. Smith believed and did. And the fact that my mom, they moved back to Utah. My um, grandfather worked in the church office building, served in high callings. He was a mission president several times and, you know, had a big Mormon funeral where the general authorities spoke. And so he was in very, very good standing. And he was married in 1906 to his second wife. And so, anyway, yeah, so it's interesting. Was Anson, to see. Which was Bowen Call and Theresa Call's daughter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Bowen was the bishop. And then my great grandmother was 16 and was the belle of the ball. What was it called? The P- Queen of the May. She was Queen like. Queen of the May. Yeah. She was in a, the May 5th parade down there in Mexico. And that's where William Sears and his wife saw her and said, oh, maybe she's the one that we should ask to join our family by being William's polygamous wife so that we can have children. William can have children through her. Yeah. That's the story. That's that is in <laughs> it's documented in this book. Um, at the oh, back. Good. Okay. Yeah. As I mentioned before, uh, I'm bad at moving. Okay. In the back of this book, it has uh, life sketches of all of Anson Bowen calls children and that life sketch again, which was edited, but this book was edited by Lorna call Alder. So her sister. So that's an accurate, um, story about how they account. Met. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and then um, just to go on. A, oh. Agnes, I should say Agnes's maiden name was McMurrin. Agnes's father was Joseph McMurrin, who was a general authority at the time. So it's, right. it's hard to believe that Agnes and William would have contracted right. this polygamous it might have been. manifesto marriage without his approval he was a general it might have even been him it might have been him that told that set up to go speak to joseph f smith who because he you know yeah, who, who knows? knows i mean it's just speculation because it's not documented but it could have been but yeah right. it's it is interesting that her that agnes this polygamist who became the first of this polygamous relationship that her father was His a general authority. Joseph. Father was a general authority. That is interesting. And Thressa, this is a, just a point of interest. Um, Thressa, her grandfather was Isaac Al- uh, Isaac Barlow. Isaac Barlow. And so, oh, yeah. so that's I'm, right. Yeah, she was a like, Barlow. That's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm like, which polygamous name was it? It was the Barlows. Yeah. Yep. And so, so that's really, it's like all in there. It's really interesting. Yeah. So anyway, so we were talking about Joseph F. Smith. That's why I wanted to tell that story because there was this, this conflict of feeling like 
all of the previous presidents said this was absolutely essential and that it could not be taken from the earth and this principle needs to be it's the restoration of all things yeah, never to yeah, be taken Montello away and it can't said go away that, and i go into that in this in in my chapter as well yeah john taylor was saying it it cannot it was basically at the time they were saying this is the church this is our gospel it is it was this is, this is who we are this is essential to, mm -hmm. to who we are and if you end polygamy then you would end the church which of course proved not to be true um, right but they, but but they didn't even saying they didn't even at that point really have um temple work as like temple work wasn't part of the church at that point because they didn't even have like it wasn't until the saint george temple which was right you know, just a little while before the manifesto but the salt lake temple wasn't done until after the first manifesto. So right. I guess I'm so, saying so the theology was very different. It was very much polygamy is the way to receive exaltation. That right. I mean, they were doing temple work though, starting in Nauvoo, but then you're right. The, and, until the, um, the St. George temple was dedicated in the late uh, 19th century in Southern Utah, um, they were doing what uh, temple work in what was called the endowment house. And so that's where people would go really to just, get their endowments and to be sealed. And also, I, this is one thing I also didn't realize when I started studying this, this family story was I didn't realize that sealings back then were commonly, regularly, frequently, normally um, conducted. The sealings were conducted outside of temples. I, uh, I assume that sealings always were only done in temples or the endowment house. But sealings could be done as long as it was somebody who was given that priesthood authority. Sealings were okay. performed anywhere. So that was... Oh, that okay. Was so it wasn't... I didn't know. It was the person, not the place that mattered. Exactly. It was the, the authority. It was okay. the priesthood authority um, who was authorized to to um, conduct those sealings, not the place. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's super that interesting. Was new to me. Because, I didn't know that before. Yeah, but apparently, um, well, we need to talk more about Joseph Smith, but apparently, mm -hmm. at least in our family records, we like um that that 16-year-old wife, Athelia and Will, the 39-year-old, they the that were married in 1906, they weren't sealed. So it was the understanding of as far as you know. <laughs> I, well, as as I should say know. I said that's that's what my family believes because it was understood that they weren't born in those children weren't born in the covenant is what the people now have so the temple in any case yeah so that's so the generation actually, above me did the temple work for them. Yeah. Yeah, they, so it's interesting. Like, so that's that's like the interpretation mm -hmm. now. But I just want to caution, like, so sure. before we started talking, I told you about this source that D. Michael Quinn, historian working um, for the Church History uh, Archives back in the 1970s, um, he identified a book. It was called Temple Ceilings Performed Outside of Temples, Book B. Um, so, okay. so we know there are, and, and then I've also perused records at the Utah State Historical Society archives that, um, I think it was Anthony Ivan's papers were not donated to the LDS Church History Department, but to the, the State History Archives. And Anthony Ivan's records shows countless ceilings that took place, uh, polygamous and just first marriages that took place in the uh, Mexican LDS colonies. So there, there yeah. are records I'll outside dig in. Of the initial ones about sealing. So there may be, you know, and again, it would take further research, um, but it may be that they in fact were actually sealed and they're just not in the official right. records of the church. Does that make sense? Right. Ab absolutely. I, I think it's it's an interesting question that I, that's all yeah. the point I was making. The generation older than I thought that they weren't sealed and couldn't find sealing records. So it's good to know where to go hunt and see um, how that works. But yeah. So do you want to talk about Joseph F. Smith? Like I want to talk about really post-manifesto polygamy. It's a tragic story. I mean, polygamy in general is a tragic story, but the post the the. Like starting it was horrible, living it was horrible, ending it was horrible, right? Every side of it had huge problems, caused, yeah, so, caused pain for different people. Yeah, so so horrible with that, that would be like, you know, our modern day interpretation. So people who actually lived it, some would say it was horrible. Some would say, no, we made it work. It was God's commandment. So it's like there's a wide spectrum of how people would characterize it. So what I observed in my personal um, observations of studying is, is it tended to lead to poverty, 
um, with some exceptions. I mean, some polygamous men were wealthy. Brigham Young, for example, was wealthy and was able to uh, provide better for his multi <laughs> many, many wives. Um, so there were some cases where there were wealthy polygamous men that they were able to provide well. But and did they tend to be the, the common leaders, people? Usually. The common people I observed, like your ancestors, um, to have just one breadwinner. And again, this is 19th, early 20th century. So women were they were working, but not so much outside the home. Anyways, what I observed was a lot of poverty and okay. um, a lot of hard times. And in fact, these women, the polygamous women would have to work harder than their monogamous counterparts to provide for their own families. Um, and then their children, as their children became of an age where they could work, their children worked hard to help provide for their families because just having one man as the breadwinner just to provide for over 20 children in many cases in several different households. Yeah, I think my great grandfather had 25 children, didn't you say it was? Yeah, I think my cousin told me 25 yeah, children. I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. it's 25. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so a lot of poverty, to be honest. Um, I also observed um, inequality among the women. And um, uh, for example, I, I shared an example with you when, when Bowen and Theresa, um, the, the Latter-day Saints of the Mexican colonies were driven out of, of northern Mexico by revolutionary violence in 1912. So they leave and they flee into the United States. And then they had a really hard decision to make, whether to stay in the United States where polygamy was illegal and where their Latter-day Saint counterparts had not been practicing it for a long time. They're monogamous. So they're not even... Well, they're kind of like pariahs in their own communities. Um, they could go and face that and not be able to live together anymore as polygamous families. And uh, the the man would have to choose which wife he was going to live with. And it was always the legally married one, the first one who he was legally married to. And so the other families would just be left to fend for themselves. I mean, it was a horrible situation. It was tragic. I mean, these stories are heartbreaking so many of these families who were told by ch church leaders they were the cream of the crop they were the most faithful because they were continuing the principle and keeping it going the principle of polygamy and then they go back into the united states and again their monogamous counterparts don't know that they've, they've been encouraged by church leaders to do this down in mexico so their monogamous counterparts or co-religionists are looking at them saying you have violated the manifesto you have broken this mm -hmm. and they're, they're looked down on. They're not given callings. Uh, it's, it's so sad. Those stories are so sad. So they had the choice to those kinds of choices. If they stayed in the United States or faced the, uh, also very difficult decision to try and go back into Mexico where they could continue to live in peace and accepted as polygamous families, but they're facing revolutionary violence and loss. I mean, you know, the, the Pancho Villa, the legendary Pancho Villa and these revolutionary armies would come into towns and take animals, horses, wagons, food that was in their orchards and, and farms and just constantly. And this happened over. My cousin that their, I talked to who she's she's done a ton of family. She wrote our little our family history books, you know, for mm -hmm. um, and, and she has stories of them actually taking their home. They kicked them out of their homes and they, um, th so, so it was, it, that was, a, that did contribute greatly to the poverty and to the reason they had to come to like go to Texas, leave Mexico. So yeah, anyway, I was just trying to add yeah. to that. Sorry, I wasn't trying to interrupt you. Yeah, no, that's okay. I, I don't recall anyone like them being kicked out of their homes, but just they, what the reason why they finally decide, okay, we've got to leave in 1912 is they come and they say, we want your guns. We okay. want your guns, now, your guns and ammunition. And then the colonists felt like, wow, there is zero way to defend ourselves in this war in Mexico if we stay. And so that's why they they left. So they weren't necessarily coming into homes and moving into homes because they were they were they were migrants. These were traveling armies, if that makes sense. So they were just passing right. through. So they weren't right, they, they were what, yeah. in the streets. And then a lot of these colonists these Latter-day Saint colonists never went back into Mexico. 
And so a lot of Mexican families would move into these abandoned homes. So anyways. Okay. Okay. But that's, kind of, that's kind of getting into the weeds there. But um, mm-hmm. so anyway, so, the, so so Lorna's family, your family, um, they they decided to come back, Anson Bone Call and Theresa, who were um, living in one part of the United States after they, they were driven out. They decided to go back and they don't consult with Julia, who's the much younger fourth wife. And they just say, we're going back. So come on is, is this letter that Bowen writes to her. And she, she is desperately, she's writing all these letters to Bowen saying all the great things about that. She's in Tucson with her mother, living with her elderly, older mother and saying all these wonderful things about Tucson and we can make this work on in Tucson. And it's okay if I don't live with you, you know, I can just be, you know, we, we don't have to live as a polygamous family, but we could at least live in the same town. And she's just begging Bowen to stay. She does not want to go back into revolutionary Mexico. And Bowen just says, Theresa and I decided it's important to keep the family together. And that's where all our property is. We're going back. So come on. So again, like I, I observed that and Julia was not treated as an equal partner in this marriage, you know, so just, so just seeing things like that with, with polygamy. Yeah. I came to, as, as we meant, talked about before, these were good people that made the best of it and they firmly believed they were doing what God wanted them to do. Um, but it led to so much hardship. And I, it convinced me that, that my, my, I mean, I was always already convinced. I didn't need to be convinced, but it just reaffirmed like monogamy is, is always the best. Anyway, yeah, so we, maybe, maybe, maybe one of those who might be watching this and they might disagree and that's their own experiences. But just as a historian, what I observed in history, not just in this family, but looking at countless other stories I was, yeah, yeah, it was just gut wrenching to see what polygamy did to people. And also looking at records of polygamous marriages, how many of these were teenage girls, older teenage girls being married, oftentimes to much older men, just really troubling mm-hmm. things like that. Right. Yeah. And then seeing that carry on that they never really were equals because they were always the age of their children. Mm-hmm. Right. So so it's, it is, yeah. it is yeah. hard. So and let's and talk. Oh, many of these families, they never, like with the, the later wives, they never, they, the first wife was the one who, you know, they could afford to have the nice home for the first wife. But then by the time the third or fourth wife comes along, there's, there's no more reason. There's not enough money. And so they would live in houses, not nearly as nice, kind of in poverty until their own children would grow up and start working. And then their children would provide a decent, you know, a nice home for them. So Mm -hmm. that was the case with Lorna. Lorna starts working and she goes home and she's the one who provides for her mother and she provides her mother this beautiful, really nice home, which her dad thought was great. And it wasn't like Bowen was trying to say, well, she doesn't deserve a nice home. They're just, they literally didn't have the resources to have a second nice home for Julia. Right. So it took, it took her children growing up and starting to work before she finally had a, as nice a home as Theresa had. Right. And we should clarify when we're saying a nice home, we don't want to think of modern standards. We just mean a decent place to live. Yeah. With those, a, like, a nice of that age. and just, yeah, just a, just a comfortable. Like just, yeah. Not basically either a little, fort or you know kind of a bungalow or like like sometimes a dugout that i mean the the ways that some of these people had to live was really hard yeah and and, and granted some some people who were monogamous lived that way too but but definitely polygamy exacerbated that problem for for most so it was okay, a hard for most life. okay and and they right. they all acknowledged that it was a huge sacrifice to live this but again i admire them in that they they made those sacrifices because they believe it. That's they believe that's what their God wanted them to do. Right, they were people of they incredible made, faith. They made the most. They they tried to live it as as faithfully as they could, and and tried to be kind um, to each other. Some wives, there's great stories of some wives who were super close and had a great friendship, and then there's others where they just make the best of it. Right. It's not I do. Yeah. It's not it's not a beautiful thing. 
yeah, I think in general, polygamy does not. Anyway, from what I've seen, and I don't, you don't need to to chime in on this because I know you need to stay very professional, right? And not just give personal opinion. <laughs> but from what I have seen, like people who could make polygamy work were just such good people that they could have made monogamy work beautifully, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, mm, so it's absolutely. not like they. <laughs> Yeah. It's not like polygamy improved anything. It's not like people. I think that polygamy taught how to be incredibly selfless. You just I had think to. It just, could, but there's also a lot not, of selfishness. You had there's to not thing. care about yourself very much. You had to. I guess. I guess I could say women. that poverty, Particularly, poverty can do the same thing. Sure. Yeah, exactly. And polygamy is not the only way to learn to become selfless. I'm not saying that at all, but, right. but it could teach because you had to sacrifice so much to make it work. It it could teach selflessness, but there are so many other more healthy ways, in my opinion, to learn selflessness. Right. I think the reason I push back on that is because when, when I engage with people so often, people will use the things they see of polygamy that weren't terrible to justify it or to say, see, yeah. look at the, and I always feel like, you, do you know what? I can be, I can have a best friend and not sharing a husband and, and resources and wife with them. Yeah. Right. Like I could, I could have even a woman we can share caring for the children responsibilities if we want to. So one of us can go have a profession. Like they say, it gave the women more independence. I'm like, no, it gave the women less support. So they were forced to like, one of the women would have to stay and tend all of the children. So another one could work. It wasn't necessarily. Yeah, you, it gave I mean? Some women, it gave a very small fraction of women more independence. But yeah, so we right. hear the stories about like, you know, the sister wife that would stay back and watch the kids. So the other wife could go off to the East and go to medical school and do all these amazing things. Those stories are the rare, rare exception. That's that's not the case for most women who live polygamy. And we ignore the woman staying home, taking care of two or three times Absolutely. as many children. They, that's they, not they, fun. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I shouldn't say that's not like, fun. I just mean that's another, hard. Another um, post manifesto polygamous woman, and that's Martha Hughes Cannon. Uh, she married Angus Cannon. I believe she was his third or fourth wife. Oh, I don't remember off the top of my head. But anyway, she was his plural wife. And what she sacrificed, what she lost. She um, was a physician. She was super well accomplished. She chose to marry him. And she runs, she was the first woman in the nation elected to be a state senator. She's famous for that. And this is in 1896, 25 in Utah, 25 years before most women in the United States can even vote. So she's wow. holding this elected office, but what happens? She's married polygamously and she becomes pregnant by her polygamous husband. And she has, she goes into exile rather than testify against him, um, which would have sent him to prison. And so she goes into exile instead. Because the, the women and children were being forced to testify. Her career has ended, and she lives in exile twice. And, I mean, she would say, well, I chose him. I chose that. But you look at, you look at what it cost her. What she lost. And, yeah, it was her choice, but I, it, that's that's – just one more, an example of a tragic story of an accomplished, very accomplished polygamous woman, but polygamy ruined her career oh, and really her life. She man. never got to live with Angus. She was always, she goes to England and then she goes to California and she, she never had a happy family relationship. Life. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I think of Annie Clark Tanner, her book is just wonderful she was brilliant and the it was the same story like her like i from reading annie clark tanner's book i kind of that's where i started to get the impression that like these could have been really good people like like these men might have been wonderful monogamous husbands but polygamy turned them into something just out of necessity it, it almost can create more selfishness or less empathy because you just can't you can't take care of you can't solve the problem. So you just have to start 
calling the women whiners, like Brigham said, the incessant whining, you know, like women yeah. who are living yeah. with. Yeah. So I think that would be the case for some men. I think it's like, you know, we have to be careful not to paint all polygamous men with a I wasn't, yeah. You know, and because I would also that say that, you know, what I observed with, with Bowen, being the father of 25 children was so hard. And again, he did, he made the most of it. He, he did the best he could with 25 children. And I do think it made Bowen more selfless because he had to, he did, he did his best to keep both what became both of his wives. Cause this third wife died too, but both wives happy. Um, and did his best to be a father to 25 children. So it did create selflessness in him. So I think it, it did right. different things for different people. I think, I think Bowen Call was right. an extremely good man. I but think, again, I he could have been an extremely good man. <laughs> he would have been an extremely good man without polygamy. That's just who he was. You know what I mean? It's not that yeah. polygamy the only way. And then, it, or we can't say that polygamy, you know, has the same effect on every people. But yeah, it did have negative sure. effect on, on a lot of men. And again, these women were just kind of, a lot of men would have a wife throughout various different towns and she'd see them occasionally. She and her kids, their children would see him occasionally when he happened to come into town. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it was not an ideal family see, life by any means. That, yeah. That's what I've seen as, as well as in addition to really exacerbating poverty, it also seemed to really exacerbate of um, neglect. There are many stories of my fathers. Yeah. Like, absolutely. They just didn't, it was like a bunch of single moms who kept getting pregnant every yeah. year, or every other year, because their husband would visit, but he wasn't a part of, that, so, so, you know, is single motherhood ideal, especially with zero support? Like if a mom is on her own trying to raise children and provide, and this was in Frontier, Utah, when there was no support, there was no, um, you know, social safety net, and there wasn't even like a nice little grocery store, most likely, where you could buy affordable food at all. Like, like it was really, really hard for a lot of these yes. families. And so, or a lot of these people, and I think, I mean, to me, um, you know, just every time when people bring up Jacob too, it's like, don't just read verse 30. Cause I think that's a misinterpretation, which again, we can talk about another time when, but, but all of the verses talk about what it does to the women and children. Like that's why polygamy, God considers it an abomination and forbidden is because of what it always does to the women. Well, I shouldn't say always, I don't want to overspeak, but, but that is the reason for the prohibition and for calling it an abomination. And it's like, look at our history. It's right there. It happened. Like it really was hard on a lot of. So I anyway, I don't want to put words in your mouth or you know make you uncomfortable. You're not, no, that. you're not at all. So yeah. So like no. yeah. So there's like different ways. It's it, polygamy is so varied. There's different ways people practice it. So for your ancestors with Anson and Theresa and Julia, the two houses were right next to each other with a garden in between. So in that case, the families did live right there together, right? But, and that is interesting. Let me just throw in, that's exactly how Will and um, Athelia, Will and Aggie and Athelia had exactly the same situation, an orchard in between in their two homes in Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so anyway. that's when I say they made the most of, they made the best of it. That was the best scenario. Um, but then, yeah, there's there's lots of cases in in, in Utah history, Mormon history that I've, I've read about and observed where there would be like a, a polygamous wife in Salt Lake, Provo, I'm thinking of George A. Smith, who was an apostle, Provo, Parowan, Southern Utah, you know, and they would just kind of drop in and visit occasionally. So it's not like it's not like the way that that your ancestors and others were practicing were actually living all together. So right. Yeah, it's me, not I have a to... family situation by any means. Did you in your research see um sort of the lost boy um predicament? Um, so, I so did, my, I did not, I did not observe that in my research. I never came across that. Of course, we oh, know okay. that that exists in, in modern, um, you know, very much. So I'm aware of that just, you know, just from watching documentaries and, and reading and so forth. But I, I did not observe it. It doesn't mean it didn't okay. happen. I'm just saying I never came across that in my research where, okay, where boys were kicked out, where boys were kicked out of a community. Mm -hmm. um, so what so, what yeah, happens? So what gradually happens with with Mexico is so you have 
you know, the first manifesto in 1890, and then what's called the colloquial second manifesto in 1904, and just gradually fewer and fewer people, young people enter into polygamy. So for example, most of Anson and Bowen's, or Anson Bowen calls children, his 25 children, I think two, three, uh, Anyway, I think maybe we're polygamous. Three end up in polygamous. I think it was three. Marriages. Is it three? Okay. What, so very small. Wasn't there one in 1906, one in 1907, and one in 1913 that we can okay. talk about? Okay. So, so three. That's, mm -hmm. um, um, but most of them marry that. monogamously, and most of them leave and go to the United States and marry. So it kind of just gradually fades out of practice. So there's never a need to, like, kick any young okay. man out of the community. Um, it didn't last long enough, people, I guess. Um, they all just become monogamous naturally, if that makes sense. You know. It does. Yeah. It's just interesting because in my family history, the oldest, uh, like I think Athelia and Will's oldest son left. And I don't know that they always were kicked out, but just kind of, it, it just looked like, oh, that's interesting that there was sometimes a dynamic where, you know, where the boys would leave or maybe, I don't know. Anyway, and it could be. Yeah, they all reasons, went. But. So this is something I admire about your ancestors too. Like education was very, very, very important to them. They were all very well educated. So they all went to the Juarez Stake Academy, which was an excellent um, high school education. And then they all go on to college and to go to college, they all go up to um, Utah to go to school. And okay. Get an education. Okay, yeah. that's really neat. And I actually blessing and encouragement. Yeah. Okay. And maybe I'll play this at the end. My um cousin that put these histories together, she has recordings of and of Bowen um reciting poetry as as an old man. Did you listen to those recordings? Were you able to hear uh, those? Well, there's a CD in the back of the Anson Bowen Call biography. Yeah, and it's him. I okay. think it's his 90th birthday mm -hmm. reciting some poetry. Yeah. So I have heard that. So you have heard that. Okay. It's really fun. So, yeah. Okay, good. So uh, can you talk about, so, uh, so the first manifesto that from what I understand was originally given, like um, Wilford Wood was, was speaking at a state conference where he gave that message and uh, then it was given general, a view of it. It's at general conference where he issues the manifesto, the 1890 manifesto. Wilford okay, Wilford. I thought it was made up from kind of a conglomeration of different speeches he had given throughout the territory, but then, but he yeah, issues no, he actually it. like reads it and issues it at general conference. Right, but okay. he had been speaking and, like there had been talks about where this was going before. Okay, mm -hmm. and so that was given in general conference in Salt Lake. So the 1904 manifesto was that given in general conference in Salt Lake? Yes, because it's it's, it's confusing because issuing it acknowledges that they were dishonest in the first one or that they were duplicitous. So it, it, it's it's a tricky situation for the church back then, still today, right? So yeah. so go ahead. Mm -hmm. So it was on, um, so I should back up and explain that what the context, the historical context of what's going on. So in 1904, an apostle of the LDS church named um, Reed Smoot is elected to the U.S. Senate from the state of Utah. And um, Smoot is monogamous himself, but a lot of um, non-LDS leaders in the Salt Lake City community, they write Congress and they say, look, the Latter-day Saints are still practicing polygamy and it's still being taught by church leaders, which was true. And so they asked Congress, Congress not to seat Senator Smoot, even though he himself is monogamous. So these Smoot hearings take place from 1904 to 1907, in which Joseph F. Smith, as president of the church, um, and, and others are testifying and they are testifying that they're not, they're no longer practicing polygamy, but in fact, there's strong evidence, of course, that, that they are. Um, so did those start so, in 1903? They, did you say um, 1903 is when they started? 19, because no, the Senate hearings started in 1904 and they lasted for more than three years. Okay. Okay. So I'm reading right. from my chapter here. If people, yep, again, want I to trust you. <laughs> No, no, no. I mean, I know you trust me, but I mean, if just people want to dig into what I'm reading from, that's... that's oh, great. So okay. um, so where was it issued? Was it issued at conference? So, so in that context, um, the church realizes they've got to do something to address their damaged reputation. 
because they're still practicing polygamy even after the 1890 manifesto when they said they were. So um, on April 6, 1904, Smith issues what became colloquially known as the Second Manifesto. And I'll just read the, I'll read from it right here. Inasmuch as there are numerous reports in circulation that plural marriages have been entered into contrary to the official declaration of President Woodruff, the 1891, I, Joseph F. Smith, President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, hereby affirm and declare that no such marriages have been solemnized with the sanction, consent, or knowledge of the church. That's absolutely okay. not true. Um, it- and then, um, and close quote, the, uh, this statement added that, quote, if any officer or member of the church shall assume to solemnize or enter into any such marriage, he will be deemed in transgression against the church and will be liable to be dealt with according to the rules and regulations thereof and excommunicated. So that's what's new about this second manifesto is um, that it it would it mentions excommunication for anyone who does enter or um, teach continued plural marriage. So that was again, April 6, 1904 in general conference. And it resulted in a dramatic reduction, if not a cessation of new LDS plural marriages, even outside of the United States in Canada and Mexico, where these colonies existed. Um, Okay. So, so can I ask you, so my understanding is the 1890 manifesto already decreased plural marriage quite a bit, it like did. it tore down the endowment house. And so that already minimized it a lot. It, yeah, and it then, started to decrease it. Absolutely. But it was still going on, particularly in and, Mexico and Canada. Right, yeah. right. And so the 1904 one, I'm just curious if there were... Decreased it even more. Mm-hmm. Even more. And I think there were probably a lot of members in Salt Lake or Utah that were like, what? It's still happening? You know, I wonder <laughs> if a lot of them genuinely yeah, didn't know. Yeah, and that's kind of like what today. this, that's what's going on is you have these um, most mainstream Latter-day Saints at the time, they think the manifesto, that's it. And they're just only entering into monogamous marriages after the that that point, most mainstream Latter-day Saints did not know that church leaders were encouraging some people to move to Mexico and to Canada to continue to practice, to keep the principle alive, if you will. Right. Okay. So 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 it was the Mexican Revolution that drove all these families, polygamous families, out of Mexico, back in the United States, that the mainstream monogamous Latter-day Saints who don't know that church leaders have been encouraged, they're like, you people have been violating they? the manifesto. They considered it's them like the right. FLDS, like, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, so okay. what happens is um, after this, um, uh, Joseph F. Smith, after issuing this manifesto, he goes to Mexico in September, 1905. And he, um, goes to the Mexican colonies to reinforce that 1904 manifesto. And he says, quote, there are no plural marriages being performed at present in the church in Mexico or anywhere else. Smith told the men of the colonies in a Juarez stake priesthood meeting. Continuing. Okay. Oh, be true to your wives and your children that God has given you, for God will hold you responsible. But men cannot marry plural wives at present, he says, with my consent, nor the consent of the church. The church is upon trial before the government of the United States, and we must be very careful, referring to the smooth trials, the smooth hearings. So, okay, so he's saying, again, we believe this principle, we you know, are not abandoning the principle, but right now is not a good time to be doing it is kind of the message. If, if you know, that can be an, an interpretation. Um, oh, okay. He says, Do you have he a different says, one? At present twice. That is my interpretation. And I explain okay. it um, in my article, but that's how I interpret it, that uh, Joseph F. Smith was thinking, 
okay, for now, just to get the government off our back, at present, we're not going to do this anymore. But what happens is gradually more and more young people, again, this we're now in the 20th century, so we're moving into more modern times. More and more young Latter-day Saints are like, oh, I don't want to practice polygamy, particularly women. Oh, okay. Young women. They're like, eh, nah, not for me. <laughs> and so they as more and more no. mainstream Latter-day Saints start marrying monogamously, it just kind of naturally dies out in mainstream Latter-day Saint practice. Um, and I say mainstream because um, some splinter groups um, start and are continuing today where they say, no, we're going to continue to keep this principle alive. Mm -hmm. And okay, so this gets into the really sticky problem. Uh, like, I mean, like we talked about, polygamy is just like the gift that keeps on giving the problem that never goes away. Right. Yeah. Because if we, so for a long time, my, my, um, percept, perception is that the church really tried to minimize the statements by Brigham Young and John Taylor and, you know, even Wilford Woodruff and Joseph, like, like really tried to say no. And, and we're still doing this today. Like they never said it was necessary for exaltation that like mm -hmm. polygamy was just like, yeah. like even, the statement is like the norm, like like monogamy is the norm, and there are rare exceptions when. So we've really reinterpreted it, but we've not been very forthright about what was actually taught, which I think causes a problem I because think, then I people. Think what happens? I think what happens, Michelle, is is this history just kind of fades from over time. It just kind of fades from Latter Day Saint memory, and until. Um, historians. Um, I'm thinking of D. Michael Quinn, whose memoir I just right. edited and, and he wrote all about his, he discovers as a teenager, um, a book by Samuel W. Taylor that it's about, and he realizes, wait, no, Latter-day Saints, mainstream Latter-day Saints were practicing polygamy after 1890. So he, he does a ton of research uh, on the subject. Um, and we have his work, but I think it just kind of falls out of general memory and then until and unless historians and now there are lots of us um who come Dig across this and write about this and talk about this it's it's just kind of forgotten i don't i yeah mm -hmm. well you know what i should i should go back we should back up before we go on to this and talk about sort of the colloquially called by some people the third manifesto because even after so the first manifesto is 1890 that minimizes, that reduces polygamy, but it's still very present and it's still believed in. By 1904, the second manifesto, which again, reduced it, didn't eliminate it, and it's still believed in. And my yeah. understanding is it's in the 1920s that they actually start excommunicating people for real. And that, like, I think it was Heber J. Grant that was the president that started actually enforcing um, it with more heavy hand. I think it's, and that's I think when the break up sooner than that, because Anthony Ivins, who incidentally had lived in Colonial Waters, but he was um, monogamous. Okay. He is, he starts after the second, um, and I, I'm not, I'm fuzzy on my research. Sorry, it's in my chapter, but he starts, um, going after people and excommunicating people who are still entering into new polygamous marriages. But yeah, I'd have to look at the dates okay. for that, but I, so but I know that, that becomes his, he is charged with, with doing that with kind of like trying to stamp it out. Um, okay. In so maybe it's like coming from the actual top where there aren't kind of any more winks and nods and tacit approvals. Cause like my yeah. grandfather was my great grandfather, it was 1906, but he was always in perfect standing with the church and yeah. You know, I I can't remember. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble. I don't know if it was Joseph F. Smith that spoke at his funeral, but it was somebody spoke at his funeral. It, it, it wouldn't have been, you know, so I can I can find out who that was. But um, yeah. so anyway, here's so there's still. Can I read? Oh, so can I read the 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 next couple of paragraphs because it it touches exactly on what what you're bringing up. Yes, please. In this chapter, so um. So these are this is my these are my words now. So several weeks later, so several weeks after September 1905, when Joseph F. Smith goes to um, the colonies to and shares this message in Mexico. Several weeks later, Smith, Joseph F. Smith, secured the resignations of John W. Taylor and Matthias Kelly from the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles for performing post-manifesto marriages. Taylor and Kelly maintained 
that they had been authorized to do so. Since the late 1880s, obfuscation of and disagreement over plural marriage policy by members of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve had created a general confusion among church members. Growing numbers of monogamous Mormons in the United States did not know that church leaders had authorized some plural marriages after 1890. Even among those who did know, perplexity set in as to who exactly had the authority to perform plural marriages after the 1890 and 1890 and, and 1904 manifestos. So that's kind of that mass confusion you're talking about that I was talking yeah. about. And it's it just and it, it just really kind of gradually fades from collective Latter-day Saint memory. Right. And the FLDS, because that confusion still exists today. There are the FLDS stories that are the like Mormons going, is this our doctrine or is it not? And, you know, so so I think I see what you're saying that it faded from memory because the FLDS really were a part and not really known until Short Creek. Right. And then it was kind of like, oh, those are the weird guys, uh, you, you know, the, the FLDS. And anyway, so it's been an interesting journey. But what I have seen happen, I've seen this myself, is someone finds those old teachings in that, I don't know, that book by Samuel W. Taylor, but I know that there are books that are passed around with speeches from either the Journal of Discourses or other polygamous speeches that people mm -hmm. find and go, oh, this is the real Mormon doctrine. We're doing it wrong and kind of convert to fundamentalism. It's still an ongoing problem because the reason for post-manifesto polygamy is belief in the doctrine, right? Which we have never resolved. So it still is a danger for people Yeah, I mean, today. it's still canonized in Doctrine and Covenants 132 when it talks about the law of celestial marriage. Celestial marriage uh, at the time in the 19th century meant polygamy. Um, and it's also um, part of our, our temple sealing policy in... And again, when I say R, I say, I mean, mainstream Latter-day Saints, yes. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that um, a, a man can be sealed to more than one woman, but a woman cannot be sealed to more than one man. And not for this life, but for, you know, the next life. Right. So, again, it's very much part still existing in, in, in our doctrine today. Right. Even though... So that's you, even though you would be excommunicated for practicing polygamy, you know, actively in this life. Right. But still it's, it's, it's there. I it guess is this is what I want to say. The, the attitude I grew up with, the perspective that I grew up with, or that I, you know, thinking when polygamy, when we're worthy, we'll be living polygamy again. That is very in line with the story that we, you know, and when I met those FLDS people who said, we're supposed to, our ancestors were called to keep the principle alive yeah. until that made, like, I'm like, okay, I can't yeah. say you nay. And yeah. right. And so I think it does, I, I guess it does put the church in this impossible position of like, it's we very can't, difficult. It's very difficult. Because yeah. talking openly about it could convert more people to polygamy if they don't do it. The If we don't do the work, well, the work I'm trying to do to say, look, polygamy was never right. It was never right. The scriptures make that so clear yeah. that, you know, that's like, anyway, it's really interesting because because if we listen to those first presidents of the church, it sounds like you have to live polygamy to receive the blessings of exaltation. Yeah. So my role as a historian is to just research the history, document it, put it out there, and people can do what Let they want. Let it do what it's going to do. <laughs> but, right. Yeah. But but yeah, I you know I I put it out there, confirm its accuracy. I will talk about it. Talk about what what I've found. Talk about my interpretations, and then and then people just have to do what they want about it. But yeah. I, personally just observing it I, I observed a lot of negative effects from this and, and and a lot of negative effects for the um church of jesus christ of latter-day saints as well because this is a really tough a tough part of its history to grapple with and i don't know what the answers or solutions Let, are. right right Let, well I, i'm obviously very opinionated about this point but that's the purpose of my podcast so but let me ask you this did you 
what what did you experience as you were digging out this post manifesto information and finding out what the teachings were and what the doctrines were? Did you ever go, oh shoot, we're not doing the church right? Or did you ever think, oh no, if I release this, could it convert more people to fundamentalism? Or I mean, did you have any moments of what does this mean? How like like? And I'm asking you, I guess, a personal question, not necessarily. Sure. Yeah. So, so my me personally, I think polygamy is wrong. Okay. It's wrong today. And I think it was wrong. Um, just because I've, I've just seen so much of the heartache, not just post manifesto polygamy, but starting in Nabu, even though my ancestors mm -hmm. practiced it. Um, I, I've just seen all of the, the negative problems it created. So, so my personal feeling is it was wrong. Um, I just want to pause and say how lovely it is that we agree on that. I think that's a wonderful <laughs> thing. So we have to look at the agreements too. So, okay, continue. Sure. sure. Um, yeah, it was disturbing. I mean, I think it's always disturbing for any historian to just start digging into history, whether it's American history, church history or whatever, and and find the the primary sources, the incontrovertible primary sources that you have to face and that contradict the, the legends. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but so that was, that was troubling for me to find out, no, actually the church leaders were encouraging, continue to encourage, encourage polygamy. It just in more refined ways after 1890 and to see Joseph F. Smith's lying, frankly, in that second manifesto saying, we have never encouraged it, or we don't eat. We we don't. If anyone's entered in polygamous marriage, it's been without our knowledge or consent. When it's undeniable, it's all it's all in there that they knew. So yeah, that was very very disturbing to to okay. see those, that, that they were lying about it. Absolutely. And did you read the teachings of um, Brigham Young and John Taylor and others about that? This is absolutely essential or mm -hmm. the church is an apostasy basically. So did that, did like, what did you think of that? How did you? I think they were wrong. I think okay. they were wrong. Okay. And this is what you and I agree with or disagree on. Um, I do believe that Joseph Smith instigated polygamy and I think he was wrong. I think it was Okay, wrong. okay. So. And see, actually we agree on that because when I started my podcast, I, I was like, Joseph Smith, the history's a mess. I have no idea. It looks to me like he was involved to some extent. And it was wrong. It, like, like I didn't like that the argument was, was Joseph or wasn't Joseph? And that would mean it was right or wrong. I was like, it doesn't matter what he did. It was wrong. It was yeah, and how that's, I started. And I've made that conclusion about, I think it was wrong based on my observed study of yeah. all the sources, of, of the countless, countless sources. I, it's, I don't think it was a good thing. I still so that, think it's an easy way to live. Okay. But again, that's interesting know, that we my, came to it my in opinion. different directions. Yeah, no, I, 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 you came to it through the actual historical um, experiences, right? The record mm -hmm. of lived experience. And I came through it to, to it through the scripture, the study of the scriptures. Anyway, I just think it's interesting that there are different ways to arrive at this, what I sure. consider truth, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so did you have any um, thoughts about if we... I mean, it seems to me that the church, it's a tricky situation. If we make it known that there was all of this post-manifesto polygamy, it could validate the polygamist ideas. Yeah. Did that? So, did so for me as a historian, all? oh yeah, so that's what you were asking. So how did I feel about putting that information out there? For me, again, as a historian, that's not my call. My, my job as a professional historian is sure. to just say, here's the research, here's the documentation for it, here's the sourcing. And put it out there and let the chips fall where they may. It's it's you know so it's not my call to say oh this is this could be damaging. Right. I'm not going to publish this. Like that's not being a, a professional historian. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so, glad you handled that way. I just wondered if there's ever. <laughs> I think that people struggle with. I think and maybe this is a ch question more for church leaders. Like I think that probably is a what's the best way to handle this? We wish it would just go away and be invisible. That's not going to happen. So uh, like, like I think if you read I think the gospel, what I, yeah. So I think what, what I've learned, Michelle, with writing about mountain meadows is it is what it is. It happened. And the best you can do is just gather all the information you can put it all out there, shine all the sunshine you can on it saying, this is what happened. 
own it, not trying to deny it, not try to sugarcoat it. Um, and so, so I've learned that with Mountain Meadows, right? I feel the same way about post manifesto polygamy. I feel the same way about our nation's history, about enslavement mm -hmm. of of Africans, of of Black people. It happened. It's horrific. It's exactly. hard to face, but it happened. You know, and but we can face it. We can deal it. We can face it, and just own it apologize I, for it where we can and and move on i mean that's that's well, learn we from it yeah no or well, like we can learn from it genocide in our nation of of american indians of native peoples yeah it's horrific it's, it's it is horrible horrific. it's hard to face especially if you're a descendant of a colonizer like i am like you are like mm -hmm. we are as as, as white european it's, americans it's hard to face the truth of what yeah. Our ancestors did, but it happened. Mm -hmm. It's almost it hard. <laughs> like, like with all of the focus on Mountain Meadows, mm -hmm. I posted something about um, our interview talking about Mountain Meadows. And one of my good friends who is um, descended from, I think she's mostly um, Polynesian from the, from the islands. And I don't know if, if I'm using any terms that are incorrect. I apologize, you know, but I want to be sensitive, but she responded and her comment was so heartfelt. It was like, I just have to say that Mountain Meadows gets all this attention, but is it called the Bear Creek Massacre? See, I don't even know the name of it. She's like, that right. happened too. And I and I was agree. like, I and hear yeah, you. A like, message, yeah, uh, a message I frequent frequently share is this is just one massacre right? that I wrote about you, my co-author, but there are, the, and I talk about, it, and we actually have information, for example, about the Bear River massacre of more than 400 Shoshone people in what is today Southern Idaho. And yeah, so it's important to, to not just talk about one massacre or right. one horrific thing that happened in our history. It's important to talk about all these things. And so I'm really glad yeah. that your listener brought that up because it is important to talk about the, the massacre of the many massacres of of native americans and others that colonizers throughout our history perpetrated or just That's people or just people it's just i think i don't think there's necessarily guilty groups it's like people we, we that's why it's so important to dig it out so we can learn from it so we can recognize these mm -hmm. are people like we're people and how what can we learn to not repeat errors of the past repeat and that's of the past and yeah and that's why it's important mm -hmm. to to delve into history even very very difficult challenging painful history it's so we can learn from it and be aware yeah. of it and sometimes it's really hard to face it's hard to face but it happens and that's a historian's job is just to put it out there and let people do what they will with it not to um try and hide it or obfuscate it mm -hmm. it's not our that's job We're right correctly <laughs> so right that's i do think i do think it is it is important to i don't want to say expose it but to reveal it it's important to let it be out on the table so that we can talk about it and that's what i do think i'm like the we can't repent, but, and I know we use different words for that, you know, sure, but for yeah. me, it's like, yeah. if we can see what polygamy actually did and what post-manifesto polygamy did and what these teachings were and what they led to, then we can really analyze them, sure. you know, mm -hmm. spiritually and logically and in every way and say, is this of God? Right. And I think the first step to that is being, is putting it out on the table. Right. So I appreciate the work you do. I think, man, I mean, it's like, here's this really kind, awesome, brilliant woman that is the Mass for massacre and post-manifesto polygamy. Like that is, that's an amazing resume. So I just, well, I want well, to thank you. you. That's, that's nice of you to say, Michelle, I appreciate that. And I get, we won't have time. We wanted to talk a little bit about my um, ancestor. Well, well, aunt. She's the younger sister who got married in eighteen in nineteen thirteen polygamously. But we'll probably have to get into that another time. But that's an interesting story. And so, anyway, is there anything else that you would want to bring up that we left out? We didn't cover. We've covered it a lot, and I look forward to future conversations with you. Um, I do have to say, let me just give a shout out because 
Barbara was exceptionally patient with me last night, letting me <laughs> kind of to some extent make my a, case. We had a great debate. We had a great yeah. debate about when polygamy started and who started it. But but it, frankly, that's mm -hmm. what I love about history. I love I love talking about the sources and. And, yeah. Uh, so we're and it's always in it's always in respect whenever I debate anyone about any aspect of history. It's always with respect and just um, with the feeling that uh, through debate and discussing things and sharing sources, we teach each other and we 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 learn from each other. So. That's fabulous. So I, anyway, I really want to, I want to thank you for that. Cause I really, sometimes that feels like it's missing in the discussions is can we look at the sources? So anyway, so I want everyone to like buy Barbara's books, give her a big shout out and just tons of respect and appreciation for what you've done and just who you are as a person. Thank you oh, so thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And it was so fun to get to know you better and to find out I had written all about your family history. That was <laughs> nuts. That was nuts last night. So anyways. That was fun. Okay, thank you. And I will talk to you again soon. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you again to all of those who have stuck through for this entire conversation. I thought it got better and better as we went along. Another huge thank you to Barbara for dedicating so much time to this or letting us have so much of her time and for willingness to engage in these important conversations. I'm really looking forward to continued engagement. I just think that the more information that we can all share together, the more that we can all learn. So I, I, so greatly respect Barbara's willingness to engage and to hold, to hold to her guns. I just think she's wonderful and I'm very thankful to have spent this time with her. So thank you so much and I will see you next time.